When I graduated college, Jeff, I literally spent way too much time thinking if I should take a full-time job offer, working at a corporate company, or continue with my business. Mind you, at the time, my business was already making more profit than the salary offer I had. So imagine how deep the conditioning is and like the environmental influence was for me to actually be like, hmm, I don't know if going full-time with my business is actually the right idea. Welcome to this week's episode of People Are The Answer. I truly believe that people are the only answer to the world's many problems. I'm Jeffrey M. Zucker, a serial entrepreneur, here to learn how innovators are creating outsized, transformational social impact and a shine a light on all the good happening in a world often hyper-focused on the negative. Today's episode features my friend Shireen Jaffer, founder and CEO of Skillify. After transforming hundreds of thousands of lives through her work, Shireen has received a variety of accolades over the years, including USC's 2014 Entrepreneur of the Year, Top 12 Social Ventures from Clinton Global Initiative, Forbes 30 Under 30, and many more. Shireen and I discuss her journey from Pakistan to the U.S. at age seven and the incredible sacrifices her parents made to make it possible. We also cover the duality she experienced growing up in Palo Alto, the variety of jobs she worked from ages 12 to 18, when she realized what's valuable in life versus in our educational system, transforming education, and so much more. Here is Shireen Jaffer on People Are The Answer. Shireen, thanks for joining me on People Are The Answer. Yeah, excited to be here. Been very excited for our conversation, and uh, I'm going to start off with a little bit of a hard hitter. You know, what would you say motivates you in life? Oh, <laughs> um, what it's almost like there's a logical answer, and then there's the truth. Um, I think that's a good question. What motivates me, man? There's just uh, I always tell people this. I grew up really poor. And I feel like as a kid, I didn't really see my life post like the age of 27. Like for some reason, my life was always, you know, you go to college, you get a job in a high rise building, you wear a pencil skirt and high heels and you join the business force. And then you get married at 27 and have kids. And apparently your life is over at that point. Like that was it. And now I'm 30. So I like to call it my like bonus realm, like I'm in bonus mode in life. And so what motivates me is honestly just like living life, just like living all the experiences that I can possibly live, hopefully like not painful ones. Um, But yeah, like honestly, truly, I feel like that's what motivates me. Um, And then there's obviously like the other big motivation, which is I just want to create so much value. I think that's something that people tell me um that they see me motivated by it's this like constant desire to just constantly be helpful and adding value but like i'll selfishly say i think it's just i want to feel valuable right like that's what life is about so i think fundamentally it's motivated by living a lot of good life (laughs) awesome i i can certainly appreciate that it's the best way to live life absolutely and uh just for my understanding and background you know where, where are you based I'm in San Francisco now. Um, I bounce around a lot, but I'm back in SF as of nine months ago. Awesome. And uh, where did you grow up and what was it like there? Uh, so I spent the first seven years of my life in Pakistan, in Karachi, Pakistan. That's where I was born. Um, and then when I was seven, I moved to Palo Alto. So to answer what was it like there (laughs) is very different (laughs) depending on which city we talk about. Um, So yeah, when I grew up in Pakistan, I grew up pretty like lower middle income class. Um, I had this recent epiphany in a really beautiful um, like coaching session I did with a bunch of my founder friends. We were asked, you know, what, what was the moment you knew you were truly in your purpose and in your calling And it took me way back to like my first seven years in Pakistan, where I think I just grew up at the time. It was, I'm sure it was subconscious for me as a kid, but I feel like I grew up as the black sheep. Um, So it was very much, it was really weird growing up in Pakistan, being who I am. Um, I feel like I never belonged. I think my parents saw that really early when they got this bouncy daughter that was, you know, very loud and very much a rebel um, and wanted to do everything her own way. And I think my mom very clearly saw that if her daughter continued to grow up in Pakistan, she would never actualize 
her calling and her purpose and her potential. So all to all growing up in Pakistan was really confusing for me as a kid. Um, but then when I was seven, I moved to Palo Alto. And that was just us winning a luck lottery, honestly. Um, my parents are not in technology. Um, there's a long story here that I'm happy to share. But long story short, we moved to Palo Alto out of sheer luck. And I think growing up in Palo Alto was the greatest thing that could have happened to baby Shireen. Um, I think it was the first time, like, stepping in the land of innovation and big dreams and just like this passion for creating a ton of value really fast. When I stepped into that environment at the age of seven, I feel like I was finally where I was supposed to be. Um, and then, yeah, growing up was, you know, I was still, I mean, our family was still pretty poor. Um, so growing up in Palo Alto was still very confusing, uh, but in a different type of way. And it was just, it was this constant reminder for me that it doesn't matter where you come from, the exposure, the opportunity, the environment that Palo Alto created, um, the environment is everything. And so if you can just get yourself in the right environment where the parts of you that you want to be selected um, are selected, for me, that was Palo Alto. It selected my ambition. It selected my craziness. It selected my boldness um and so yeah it was just an incredibly awesome place for me to grow up love that and and you mentioned how your parents saw that you know you weren't maybe a fit in in pakistan uh you you maybe needed other places to sort of grow and expand and i mean that's that's pretty great to know that they were caring and paying close attention that goes a really long way and um so i'm sure you're you're grateful they were able to uh do that and and make that move over yeah. And I think, you know, a lot of, I still have family in Pakistan. I still have cousins in Pakistan. And I think a lot of people recognize that there are better environments for them. So I think since my parents, even before they had kids, they knew that at the end of the day, we want our kids to live the most expansive life possible. And having grown up in Pakistan and having gone through their own struggles and their own limiting beliefs and all of the societal constructs that were imposed on them, they knew, they knew that for their kids, they wanted a better environment. So, you know, I, I think even before I was born, they were trying to figure out the right immigration um, pathways. Um, my mom was educated in one of the best nursing programs in Pakistan that were specifically designed to educate women in Pakistan and then get them into get them abroad, right? Get them into Canada, get them into the UK, get them into America, create these pipelines. Um, and so I think my mom, again, grew up, thankfully, with the exposure that through education, through opportunity, you can change your circumstance, you can, you know, actualize a better environment for yourself and your family. And she just followed that very adamantly, no matter how hard it was to actually migrate. Um, you know, just a quick tidbit, like, this was January 2001, when finally, my mom got a visa to come to America. But the only people that got the visa was her, me and my brother. My dad actually didn't get the visa. So think about it as like a, you know, as a, I think she was 40 at the time. So as a 40 year old woman um, with no family in America, pretty much, she is now being challenged to make the decision to come from Pakistan solo with her two kids, age seven and 12, right? Wow. And the woman doesn't even know how to drive. So she's literally being asked to move across the country without any support, without her husband, growing up in a place like Pakistan where the man is like everything. Um, yeah. And she just did it. Imagine like the, the awareness she had of, we got to get the kids into a better environment. There's nothing more motivating than that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's really incredible to think of all she had to go through. I mean, you know, you think of just single moms today and all that they go through, but to imagine moving from Pakistan and all of the intense cultural change and running the family, working and taking care of your kids, uh, that is really tremendous lift. And it sounds like she's the type that like when something needs to be done, you just figure out how to do it. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, um, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. And she, you know, she was the director of nursing in Pakistan. So the crazy part is when she moved to America, she had to restart, you know, get her nursing um, certification, redo the exam, do all of that. So she went from the director of nursing with like five assistants to a bedside nurse making like five bucks an hour, um, literally like cleaning up urine. Like that is what she did. Right. And that's just like one tiny example of all of the sacrifices she was making. And I think this is just so important because if I, like for me growing up, seeing these sacrifices, even though I was so young, it was just so apparent that the reason behind why she was making these sacrifices had to have been really important, right? And for her, the reason was education and everything now I've done in my life has been for education just generally. Um, but that was her like motivating driver and my father, right? He, he parted yeah. with his wife. He parted with his kids. He made a massive sacrifice staying, staying back in Pakistan. They were physically separated for five years. They weren't wow. expecting that, but you know, remember January, 2001, we moved nine 11 happens nine months later, immigration completely changes. And so my parents both made this insane sacrifice. Why? So their kids could have better opportunities, specifically a better education, a better environment. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to even imagine, um, you know, myself having kids now too. It's just like, what a difficult sacrifice to make. And it's incredible what your parents were, were able to do for you guys. And um, so once it had been five years, which is tremendous amount of time, especially in a kid's life, that was when your yeah. dad was able to to make it over? That's when my dad came and it was wild because my my brother, who's five years older than me and we're very close, um, you know, he, so I, I was I was seven, he was 12 when we moved. And all of a sudden my brother had to become the father of the household, right? The man of the house. And he taught my mom how to drive. <laughs> like think about a little like 12 year old, you know, he's like helping my mom do the examinations. He's helping my mom figure out the transportation system. He's, you know, we're getting our first laptop, our first phones. Like it's a wildly different culture coming into Palo Alto. And he's kind of leading the way. He started working at a really young age. I think he probably started working at 12, but like legally by 14. Um, and so, yeah, that's like, that's the, and it was wild because on one hand, this is the world I'm growing up in, right? Me, my brother, my mom, like we're living this like very interesting life, living in a one bedroom studio in downtown Palo Alto. Um, that's, oh my gosh, there's so, such a story there too. Um, but then on the flip side, I'm going to school in a very affluent neighborhood. I go to my friends' houses. They live in very large homes. Um, and it was just this beautiful duality and exposure point that I had that I think, you know, inspired a lot of my perspective um, that was very unconventional than most of my friends. Yeah. I mean, I can really imagine. I think it's incredibly valuable that you were able to see different ends of sort of that spectrum. Um, and was it uncomfortable? Were you self-conscious about it or were you out in the open about the differences? You know, did people come to, to your apartment at all? Things like that. Uh, yeah, I don't, I would never bring anyone over. That was, yeah, like I was just imagining thing. like um, being a kid yeah. in like, you know, and, and sort of where the perspective would go and how that kind of shaped you. Yeah, I, I think I found my strengths in other things. I definitely um, yeah, I overcompensated in very different ways. Uh, but yeah, no friend really ever came over. I remember when I was in seventh grade, so when I was 12, and we moved into a three bedroom apartment. And it was like, it was subsidized housing, like low income housing. But for me, it was just this like, holy crap, we made it. <laughs> and it was actually in preparation of my dad coming because he joined when I was 12. Um, and my mom was so, oh gosh, what a woman. She was like, I want your father to enter America, you know, not in the environment we just spent the last five years in, which was this one bedroom studio. By the way, it was a studio apartment in essentially this building called Casa Olga, uh, which is now, by the way, the Nobu Hotel in downtown Palo Alto. Oh. But back then <laughs> it the was- shift. Yes, quite a show. But back then, it was this like, in other words, like a halfway home. Um, it was like this healthcare facility for people struggling with uh, drug addiction and just like really traumatic experiences. And my mom was a nurse there. Um, and floors 
two to five were essentially for the patients. And then floor six and seven were the studio homes where Stanford students would live to do their rotations and whatnot. Um, and that's where my brother and I and my mom grew up. So, you know, I had I had some really weird experiences growing up as a kid in that kind of environment. Um, so that's just another another perspective. But all that to say, yeah, so friends couldn't come over, but I do think, you know, growing up with that perspective and with that duality, what it did show me is that there's so much more to life than what I was learning in school, right? So a lot of my friends grew up very sheltered. I didn't grow up sheltered. Like my mom didn't have the privilege, frankly, to shelter me. Um, and so I grew up with so many weird experiences and exposure points that I en- that ended up being an incredible blessing in disguise for me. Um, now, I'm very fortunate that I stayed very safe through all of it. Um, but I think I was very lucky and saw perspectives that made me realize, hey, my school is teaching me a lot of things that don't actually make sense because I'm in the real world. And like, I'll give you a quick story. Um, Mm -hmm. In this halfway home, they used to have bingo nights. And I remember being 15 volunteering at this bingo night. And there was this man who was a patient um, and he was asking me how school is going. And I was telling him about how I'm taking the SATs and I'm so stressed out. And he was like, and I don't know how true his story is, mind you, but what he said was, listen, Shireen, I went to Harvard and I went, you know, I grew up just like you where I was always focused on school and I studied all the time and I got into Harvard. And in my third year of Harvard, I had a mental break. I had a psychotic break and I was not sleeping. I hadn't slept more than four hours a night for probably five years at that point. And I just had a complete breakdown. And that is how he ended up in, you know, then it's a long story, but in the psychiatry ward. And then from there, sadly, just didn't get the support he needed. And then that's how he found himself now living, you know, struggling with addiction, abuse and all of the stuff. But he literally sat there at bingo night telling me what your school is telling you about this emphasis on grades and test scores and getting into Harvard. It's all bullshit. I need you to know that. And I need you to just enjoy your life and get some sleep. And I just remember having that conversation and just feeling so almost like relief. Like I was like, because I think intuitively, remember I've been working since I was 12. Like I worked in real estate pretending to be 18 when I was 14. I was really tall. I could get away with it. No one cared back then. So I was having all these exposure points that made me realize People aren't even asking about my age, let alone my degree, yet my school is saying I have to get into college and get a degree to be successful. So like I had these hunches from a very young age and then this dude is telling me the story and I'm like, maybe I'm right. Maybe I've been right all along. Maybe my suspicion, my skepticism, my desire to question this traditional education system that no one else seems to be questioning, maybe there's something to it. So that was, you know, that's just one example of many of just like living this weird, unconventional life and having these exposure points, the type of realizations they were creating for me from a really young age. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, it's fascinating. And it's, I think it's pretty cool to have sort of that pivotal moment where, you know, your mindset sort of shifted. Um, and, and it's so true. You know, I remember at a point in life, you know, in, where I realized that was the case, um, I feel like I was probably, you know, I never cared that much. You know, I never loved school, but I think in college, I was like, none of this, none of these grades really matter. And uh, mm-hmm. I remember trying to talk people into that and, you know, to hear it from someone with experience that, that you'll actually listen to, I, I can imagine went a really long way. And how did that shift your approach to school and work, et cetera? You know, I don't, I think in high school, I started, so Elementary school, I loved elementary school. I mean, growing up in Palo Alto as like an uh, elementary kid, we would have, like literally in fourth grade, they took us to Coloma, this like field trip where we got to mine gold because we were re- learning about the gold rush. And at the time I was like, oh my God, I've mined real gold, like with my bare hands. Obviously it was a simulation. They put gold flakes in the water, um, but it was just like such a cool experience. And then I was a kid that would like, 
do these very enterprising entrepreneurial things all throughout like pretty much elementary and middle school. So I felt very much in my element throughout that. It was around eighth grade, ninth grade, where I think like SATs, APs, grades, tests first started being shoved down our throats. Um, and that's when I, I think it was the first time I started really suspecting that I was not being taught the right things. But mind you, like every, like I'm in a 2000 person school. I have all of these you know, teachers and administrators and Stanford is right across the street. And like the vibe very much is college, right? So the brainwashing yeah. is too strong for me to be like, oh, look, I have this mindset shift. I have this suspicion. Boom. Like let's run towards that. No, I was still very much throughout high school, um, was hyper-focused on school, very suspicious, but still like, you know, straight A student taking a million APs, went to USC, did all of that. But I think there were like a few experiences now in hindsight that allowed me to, I think, take the path that I'm on now. Um, and a, two of those stories are number one, I, so when I was, this was around like, I was 15, 16, I was walking down downtown Palo Alto, Hamilton Avenue. And you know, University Avenue, Hamilton Avenue back then especially was pretty much just restaurants. and I. Pretty much, I like passed through a place that didn't look like a restaurant, so it caught my eye. It was essentially like this this office space with a bunch of standing desks and these dudes just like yelling at each other. <laughs> um, and I was like, "What is this place?" Like, it just you know, I've done this walk a million times. I've never seen this place. What is this place? So my little like curious, you know, fifteen, sixteen year old brain walks in and just starts talking to these dudes and what they're doing there. Long story short, um, they're like, hey, you know, they tell me about their job. They tell me about their work, what they're what they're working on. And they're like, hey, dude, like if you want to come spend the summer here with us, just like jamming on stuff, you're more than welcome. And I didn't know what that meant. I was like, what do you mean jamming on stuff this summer? So I went to my high school counselor the next day and I tell her about this conversation. And her advice to me is, Shereen, don't talk to strange men on the streets. By the oh, way, gee. that company was Waze. Five years later, went to went on to sell itself to Google for over a billion dollars. Wow. Yeah. And so I had wow. just met the founders of Waze. And I had just essentially been asked to come intern and be there. And yet my high school counselor gave me the most bullshit advice. You know, and, and so that was again in that moment. I didn't know, right? In that moment, I was like, oh yeah, maybe she's right, maybe, whatever. But like in, I think intuitively, subconsciously, I knew, I call I call it like an ick. Like I felt an ick. I was like, this doesn't feel right. Uh, but I just hadn't have learned the skills yet to like explore that and think for myself. So that's one example of something that was happening. Um, another thing that was happening is sadly, Palo Alto has a teenage suicide problem. And so when I was similar, same, I think 15, 16, a lot happened when I was 15, 16. Um, I was a, I think I was a junior in high school at the time, maybe a sophomore. And my friend from middle school committed suicide in high school. And I remember the conversations being around, oh my gosh, our kids are doing drugs. They are not sober. They're losing their minds. And that's why they're killing themselves. That's the conversation I remember hearing. But I knew this person and I was like, she was a really hard worker. She was a really good student. She was so stressed out all the time. Now she was put on anti-anxiety medication from a really young age. So was she doing drugs? Right? Like it, it's, it's just, it's, it was just this like really bizarre lack of empathy for what was happening to the kids in the system that I was catching on to. And I remember walking into my superintendent's office at the time, just being like, guys, I, I think we're just all really stressed out. And like, can we just do something about it? And there's a bunch of us that just want to help our friends out. And we weren't, I mean, we were mobilized in really ineffective ways. And point being is these are the types of things that were really motivating me throughout high school and understanding something's not right. Like people are genuinely unhappy. And my parents moved us to America for education. So education is supposed to be impactful and powerful, but something's not right. 
Um, and so, you know, brainwashing was really strong. I still went to college, but it was really in college where I was like, I just, I'm going to do something about this. Um, I was 18 at the time and, you know, there was, there was more suicides happening. Um, I had more of my mentees who were like 15, 16, 17. So they weren't that much younger than me. Um, but they were coming to me, you know, and saying, Hey, you got into USC. How do we get into USC? And just like, just so like, just unloading so much stress and anxiety onto me. And I was just like, okay, what if I can just replicate the experience I had in high school, which was, you know, I understood my worth was more than grades and test scores because I had exposure to the real world. I found adults from a really young age that wanted to take me under their wing. I worked in real estate. I worked in tech. I worked at a frozen yogurt place. I worked in retail. I did all these jobs. And it helped me realize, even though I was a academically strong student, I didn't really associate my worth with all of that stuff. What if I just helped these 15, 16, 17 year olds get the same exposure? And that was my hypothesis. I was like, let's just, let's just help them see the world. Um, and so at 18, I started my first business. It wasn't supposed to be a business. It was literally me just saying, yo, I see a problem. People are really stressed out. I think I have an obvious solution. It's not that hard because I've done it. Um, let me just help other people have the same type of experience I had and see what happens. And then long story short, it ended up being a business I bootstrapped over six years. And that's how my story got started. <laughs> And is that what became Skillify? Yeah. So that's what became Skillify, a little summer project where I said, I'm going to take the eight students that I'm mentoring, high school students that I'm mentoring, and I'm just going to teach them how to get jobs. And I was really adamant because I knew from my own experience that, you know, I've had jobs I hated, but because I knew how to get any job, I could just switch as soon as I became disengaged. So I was adamant that I don't help get jobs by just handing them jobs. I wanted them to just have the skills and then find the jobs themselves. So I rented out like a conference room space in downtown Palo Alto in the library. Um, and I got some Costco muffins <laughs> and I spent like three weeks just like writing all this curriculum and teaching kids how to network, how to build relationships, how to tell their stories, how to write a resume, how to have a LinkedIn profile. I think at the time you only had to be 14 to have a LinkedIn profile. Um, and I just like taught them all these like basic life skills. And I remember, and it was like an eight hour day where we just like hammered through it. Um, and I remember these eight kids coming in that morning, just so timid, so shy. And then eight hours later, just like, holy crap, like the world is now open to us. And I think what was most transformative for them is, you know, they learned these skills and we immediately had people like mentors coming in from the video game industry and architects and doctors and lawyers and designers. So my desire for them was learn it, but then immediately apply it. So you can feel the self agency immediately. You can feel the confidence immediately. You can feel that you can literally make shit happen. You can make magic happen very quickly once you have the skills and gosh, those eight kids, Jeff, just like left with such, it was clear, like something had just you know, been planted in them. And then that night I got a phone call and that phone call was from one of the kids moms. And she's like, Shereen, I think you saved my relationship with my son. And I was like, wow. I was like so exhausted from the whole day. So I was like, what, like, what are you saying right now? And she was like, no, seriously, you know, for the last five years, my kid and I have had a fight every single day because he spent so much time playing video games and I just get so upset that he's wasting his life away on video games and doesn't take school seriously and doesn't take family seriously. And, you know, tonight at dinner after your Skillify, you know, boot camp, he came home and told me how he met a video game designer from Riot Games. And that person had the same favorite video game that he has spent the last five years playing and how this guy is like 22 years old, making six figures. And, you know, he literally got that job because of this obsession he had as a kid. And for the first time, Shereen, so this is mom talking to me, he's like, for the first time, Shereen, I realized I was in the wrong. I didn't understand my son. And you've now given wow. us this language to actually talk in because he literally just told me that 
the thing I worry about is, is my son going to be successful? Is he going to be able to build a life for himself? Is he going to, you know, figure that out? He literally just told me this thing he spends hours doing gives him a path for that. And I just like, I took that in and I was like, this is what I need to do more of. I started with eight kids. I made $600, thought I was on the top of the world, but like it was these stories, right? And the fact that also it all, like that story, that, um, the transformation of the kids that I witnessed, it happened in a day. Like for me, it was as a, remember I'm 18, right? Like I'm just a kid too. So I'm just like, whoa, I can create such cool impact in a day. No one told me that, right? And so then I was hooked and that ended up becoming, you know, Skillify. <laughs> That that's awesome. I mean, it must have been kind of astounding and really rewarding to get such immediate feedback. Yeah, it's man, nothing like just oh yes. <laughs> and and also to think of an eighteen year old that's teaching these skills is pretty remarkable. So you had you know you had to have your very specific history to to have done that. Um, and yeah, I mean it's 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 awesome to start with a project and create such immense impact from it like were you able to appreciate at the time like how much you were changing these people's lives you know i so this is where um uh that's a loaded question yes and no yes in the sense that the impact was so so clear um like i would oh my gosh dude i so my marketing strategy um gosh like i really credit young Shereen for thinking so first principles based like i didn't have a business education my family's not in business like i didn't know what i was doing so my marketing strategy when i was growing skillify was um in college i would ask my friends who grew up in la and went to high schools in la i would ask them who their favorite teachers were and then i would get those teachers names and look up their email addresses online and then i would cold email those teachers with the subject line connecting via and then that student's name because what teacher doesn't remember their like favorite student Right. Um, and then I would send this like cold email being like, you know, I'm at USC. This person, I met the student. They said, you're an incredible teacher. This is a program we're working on for high school students to really learn how to get internships. I'd love to talk to your kids for 15 minutes um, during class. So I would blast out hundreds of these emails across hundreds of schools. And I would get immediate responses like, yes, this is amazing. Come on in. Right. Um, and so then I would go into, like, I would literally, I was a full-time student at USC. I would take classes on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays for me were like, I got to build my, I got to build Skillify, right? Not a business yet. I just got to build yeah. Skillify. And I would drive to all these schools, like 50 miles, hundred miles away. And I would spend 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. pretty much talking to hundreds of students um, nonstop. And I would do these 15 minute spiels in these classrooms. and at the end of those spiels, I would say, so if you're interested in these programs and these boot camps, give me your email. And they would write their email and then they would write these handwritten love notes to me. And so going back to like, was I aware of the impact? Like, man, these love notes would be like, because I would share my story, right? I would share like why I care so much. And they would just be like, I feel like, you know, I'm finally, like, I finally have a, an opportunity to be myself. I finally have an opportunity to like find something that I'm good at because I'm not good at school or kids who are like really good at school. Like, oh my gosh, I finally have like uh, an excitement of like, I love biology and you're telling me I can go be with doctors right now. I can't wait. Like it was just such, I probably, I have pictures of thousands of love notes. I used to put them on my Instagram and like all of that stuff. So yes, that impact was so clear um but being a founder during that journey and still going to a traditional school system i was still going to usc man i went to i was in the business program i did the entrepreneurship program i graduated as entrepreneur of the year right like i'm but i'm still dealing with like the bullshit of hey you're in school take school seriously like starting a job is something i had a professor tell me Hey, like college is for taking school seriously. You can build this business of yours once you graduate. So it was very dissonant where I felt the impact, but I also had all these experts telling me the opposite. Yeah, no, I can, I can actually relate having started my real estate business um, when I was in college and, you know, I just, 
I hated school. Like I, I mean, I liked where I went, BU. I liked a few of the classes, but for the most part, I hated the responsibilities of school. They got in the way of trying to do what I was doing. And, you know, ultimately just wanted to get that piece of paper at the end, you know, when, um, my, my dad passed away in 2008 and that just made me care less about school. I was just like, I just want to do what I want to do. So I can very much relate to that, but you got, not only did you get through it, it sounds like you got through it and you were still thriving on the school front. Yeah, man. I mean, dude, I like killed myself. Like I literally, and this is where people, you know, I think we really don't talk enough about that. We, we are killing generations. Like we are all of us, we all came from these traditional school systems. Some of us are luckier than others, but I gained so much weight in college. I had such dark periods in college. I went into deep depression in college. I got into a really bad car accident in college because I was in this deep depression and not thinking while driving. Like these were the implications of being in an environment that just did not let you truly be yourself. And it just like kept in I just, you know, I was working 100 hour weeks. I, it wasn't until like two years ago, so I'm 30 now. It wasn't until I was 28 where I, for the first time, felt like I had friends. Like, I, I'm like, oh, wow, like I can have meaningful friendships that, you know, are, are like just fun. Like, I did not have friends throughout my 20s because I was literally building a business, but thinking I had to go to college and like still, I was working three other jobs. Like I was still working at a fortune 500 thinking when I graduate, I'm going to go, you know, work in the high rise and work this corporate job because that's the way you do life. Like, so despite all this like amazing unconventionalism that I was exercising, when I graduated college, Jeff, I literally spent way too much time thinking if I should take a full-time job offer working at a corporate company or continue with my business. Mind you, at the time, my business was already making more profit than the salary offer I had. So imagine how deep the conditioning is and like the environmental influence was for me to actually be like, hmm, I don't know if going full-time with my business is actually the right idea. Yeah, yeah, that's unfortunate. But I, I mean, I'm glad that you pushed through and, and continued with your business. Yeah, no, me too. I'm curious as one thing that popped up earlier that I didn't bring up yet is as this 18 year old, how did you get these like video game people from the video game industry to come and talk to kids and and people like that? Is that just because you grew up in that area or? No, no, no. I, um, I, so because I had, you know, I worked, uh, in real estate, I worked in different tech companies. I like all throughout high school, I was working a lot and I just figured people out. I was like, Oh, people just want to help. Like I always told, I always, I did this and I taught a lot of other people. So I'm like, play the student card. Everyone loves to help a student. Like even when I graduated college, I was still playing the student card. Um, But the student card is just like, Hey, I'm a student. I just want to learn about, you know, architecture. And I'm wondering if you have 10 minutes to just hop on a call and like answer questions. Like that's the student card. Right. And so because I knew there were people everywhere, um, I would literally go walk into random businesses. I would LinkedIn message a bunch of people. I learned about LinkedIn at a really young age. Um, and so I would just do that. And I would, these, I ended up building up a network of, I think, 800 or so Skillify mentors from all sorts of backgrounds, like backgrounds I didn't even know existed, like careers I didn't know existed. And it was, like 95% of them were just from cold emails and cold LinkedIn messages. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's awesome. I love to hear the dedication um, and effort that went in um, when you were young. And um, I'm curious, you know, you mentioned that group of the initial eight, do you still keep in touch with any of them? I do. I do. Oh my gosh. I like three of them. Well, of the eight, four of them ended up interning for Skillify, like years later, like once they graduated high school and were in college, they came back, they would send me messages and be like, holy, you know, this was the most impactful education I had. Now that I'm in college, I realized that is really all I needed to know. (laughs) Um, And so they ended up like interning with us. um, And then I still, we had you know, Jeff, we had 150,000 students go through Skillify. Like, yeah. So like a decade later, get LinkedIn messages. I think I got one last week, actually. Um, So this happens often where people, 
my interns, my students, like someone, people, like students I didn't even personally teach, right? Like obviously we scaled the business. We had, we had many boot camps across California, across the nation actually. Um, but they would LinkedIn message me and they're like, I don't know if you remember me, but I did Skillify eight years ago. I did Skillify six years ago. Um, and here's where I am today. And here's what's been most impactful. And, you know, when I first did Skillify, I was very suspicious about, you know, the lack of emphasis on college. But then I realized, and I'm just like, oh man, like I, Skillify has absolutely changed hundreds of thousands of trajectories. And that's the power of education, that's right? Amazing. Like this isn't about Skillify. This yep. is literally about education. Give people the right environment, give them the ability to think for themselves, to really be self-agent and independent because the world changes so fast. It's silly for us to be prescriptive about what's important because what's important will change in years. And so, you know, for me, even now I'm on my second company and every, I'm so lucky that the impact that I've, you know, been able to create for the last decade, it still is fueling me. It's still reminding me that this is the power of giving people the right environment and the right tools. That's all that matters. If you're enjoying this episode, I would greatly appreciate if you could review, like, comment, or subscribe on your favorite platforms. Your engaged support goes a long way in helping the show grow and getting our impactful guests heard. Now back to the show. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I feel that um, you're saying everything we all need to hear about education and how important it is and how impactful it is. And, um, you know, I've been learning more about the education system as I have young children and, you know, trying to decide my wife and I, where they're going to go, et cetera. Like I've found that education is such an individual thing in terms of what works, what's effective. And, you know, you found something really effective for this, this certain age group in a certain place in their life. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. I like to say, you know, there's a really popular saying it's everything is everywhere. The environment selects. And so, you know, going back to my mom recognizing, Hey, like there's ambitious people everywhere, right? I was born in Pakistan. This ambition was born in Pakistan, but would Pakistan's environment select my ambition? No. Right. So it's like, everything is everywhere. And you are all these beautiful things. Every human has all this beautiful potential and trait. And if you just understand, well, what is the environment that's going to select the things you want it to select? So when you think about your kids, right? Like, you know, your kids are so different from each other. And the environment that you put one in is going to select a very different trait in them than the other. And so, yeah, it is, it is really important for us to really boil it down to education fundamentally is what is the environment, you know, what is it selecting? And then what are the tools that you have to navigate those environments? And so Palo Alto was a great environment because, you know, it had all this innovation around it. It had some of the most world-class thinkers around. However, my schooling didn't actually give me the tools to navigate that environment really well. And so I kind of learned the hard way and a lot of my friends didn't learn, but imagine if that education system was actually built to say, look at this playground, look at this amazing exposure that's already here, right? Now the company I'm building today, it's all about the digital environment. It's like all the knowledge, all the wisdom, it's at our fingertips, right? We have billions of people accessible to us online right now. So the playground already exists. Humans have done a phenomenal job connecting to each other and creating this wisdom together. But now do we have the tools to truly take advantage of that for our personal desires, for our personal potential? And that is the, you know, the missing piece right now um, that I think, you know, education is trying to solve for, like at least social entrepreneurs are trying to solve for. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, certainly some making strides in that. And, um, you know, I saw on uh, LinkedIn, actually, that, you know, Skillify, you were doing that for eight years. Can you tell me of just kind of a summary of the journey and, and where you went next? Yeah. So, um, yeah, summary, um, we, Skillify essentially started as, you know, me talking to a bunch of students about the value of internships and mentors and all that good stuff. Um, and there got to, there came a point where I would have hundreds of students from any one school 
personally doing the programs so that their parents were paying for them to do these programs. And, you know, we were so data driven since the beginning, like I've always focused on two things. Number one impact, like is what I'm doing actually worth it? Am I going to dedicate my time and life to this? Well, it's got to be worth it. So impact and data of like, what, what are the outcomes the students are actually feeling was really important. And then number two, profitability, right? For me, it's like, I want to be able to then make this impact for a really long time and I need to be profitable. So those two things were my day one focus on the impact side you know, hundreds of kids from any one school would come to the program. We would have all these surveys, like before they started the program, we would understand their confidence levels on every skills, what their anxieties were, all that stuff. Immediately after the program, we would evaluate them again, or they would self-evaluate again. So we had this immediate, like, holy crap, just from a qualitative level, from a confidence level, look at the increase. Then we would, you know, support them for a month, three months, six months after the program virtually through coaching. And we would figure out how many people got their own internships, how many people got their own mentors, right? What were those conversations like? And I would take all this rich data, qualitative and quantitative, and then I would go back to the schools. And I would say, hey, we've had 100 students from your school experience this and unlock their potential in this way. Is this something you want to offer to the other thousand students you have in your school? So that's how we went from this B to C side to now B to B side. And that's mm. what allowed me to scale to 220 schools, primarily in California, hundreds of thousands of students, pretty much by the time I was like 23, 24 years old. And so that fast like recognition, growth, impact. And then, of course, we were very profitable and lucrative. Um, it ended up getting the attention from different administrators, the Department of Education. I was talking, I was doing a lot of speeches, a lot of, you know, just sessions. Um, and that's when I started realizing, you know, at the end of the day, the incentives in our education system are just so perverse and misaligned to what the kid actually needs in the class and what the kid actually needs to thrive in the real world. And that's when I really started thinking. I started looking at one parallel experience I was having is I had met my now husband then boyfriend and you know he had dropped out of college uh, gone to the Silicon Valley started building and exiting his startups and he was showing me that through technology you could scale impact to millions of people in half the time that it took me to scale it to hundreds of thousands of people right and so I'm having this exposure of I'm in a system that's moving really slow. The incentives aren't aligned. I'm fading. I'm like up against headwinds, right? And facing all these challenges. On the flip side, I'm seeing technology scale impact really quickly. So around pretty much like 2017, 2018, I'm, I think, what am I, 26 at this point? I'm looking at myself and I'm saying, okay, I could keep doing Skillify in this way and maybe scale it to... 500,000 students, but it's it's a grind and it's slow. And the reality is there's billions of people that need this type of support, right? It's not just high school kids and college kids. It's the fact that now I have those students' parents and teachers calling me saying, hey, Shireen, I know Skillify is just for like my kid, but I'm re-entering the job market after a decade and the world has changed and I don't know how to navigate the job search and I can't remember the last time I went to a networking event. And can I pay you to help me and i was like guys i'm 25 26 years old if you're asking me someone who spent a decade as you know in consulting who i put on a pedestal if you're asking me basic life advice something's really wrong with our society and so that's when i was having this epiphany of oh my gosh like all of us have been groomed in a system where we've been taught what to think for so long that we don't actually know how to think for ourselves and the reality is any question you have on anything, your finances, your health, your career, your anything, your, you know, your, your kids, raising kids, like all of that wisdom, it's online, it's on the internet, right? It's, it's being shared by billions of other people that, you know, have very different perspectives that you can learn from. But the problem is we don't actually have technology. We don't have tooling. We don't have, we don't have the skills to make sense of all of that to think critically. And the reality is the information is also growing so fast that even if we knew how to think clearly, making sense of all that information and processing all that information is just really hard. It's just really overwhelming. And so, you know, that's when like Skillify was growing. It was growing slowly. It was incredibly rewarding, but I was having this like, just this deep calling of, I need to scale this to billions of people. How do I do that? 
um, technology was getting my attention because that was the only way I'd seen it get done. And around 2018, I started my current company, which is a technology company, software company, and it's all focused on how do we design technology to help people process lots of information and think clearly. That's the, the mission is help people think well, right? How do we help people think well? That. How do we help billions of people think well? And how do we do it, you know, really freaking fast? That's kind of how Skillify transformed into what I'm now building. Awesome. I, I love that mindset of, of helping people think well. Um, and, you know, transparently, I'm a very minor investor as of recently. I'm excited to be involved a little bit. And um, I love what you're building. You know, imagine being able to talk to your assistant, your AI assistant, and being like, hey, you know, how has my perspective on climate changed over the last couple of years? Well, if it has all the data on all the research and all the conversations you've had on climate in your database, it can start helping you do that retro and do that reflection, right? That's an incredible, like the, the power of having, you know, mentors, right? Or teachers that follow you for years is they see your growth. They can be the thought partner for you. Um, same thing, right? Like if you're trying to learn something new, if all of a sudden I'm trying to learn about crypto, how many people have tried to understand cryptocurrency and it just didn't make sense to them. Well, imagine being able to talk to your AI assistant that understands how your mind works, understands your analogies and say, hey, can you help me learn crypto? And then you can have this full conversation with them, right? That's education, that's real education. It's something that, again, it's in an environment where the exposure is already there. Cool, the internet solved for that, awesome. And then it gives you the tools to navigate that environment. Well, the tools you need is learning how to critically think and learning how to process a lot of information. And for us, Right now, just a better interface to work with a lot of data, you know, in one place that all automatically removes the friction and the barriers for processing a lot of information. That's where we're starting today. And then where we get to go is really unlocking the greatest thought partner. Awesome. Well, I think that your work's really representative of the abundance that AI technology can bring to humans. And there's so much doom and gloom out there. And of course, there, there's people on all sides of it. But, uh, you know, I certainly get frustrated when people focus on potential negatives over the potential. Um, you know, what is your sort of response to those like naysayers, doom and gloom types? Um, I say if, if, the, if the opportunity is to be fearful or be abundant, I choose abundance. You know, this is my motto in anything in life. Um, I think it's important to consider all the alternatives and consider all the perspectives. But if I move forward with any one energy truly fueling me, it's optimism and it's deep care. Um, and I think that optimism can help us solve some really dark challenges that will face us as we enter this next like huge inflection point for humanity. Um, but if you go in with just doom and gloom and that's the only perspective to then approach some really dark challenges, I'm, I don't know how that's you know, gonna serve us. So all that to say, I think we just need more perspectives around the table. I'm just someone who is very optimist, optimistic. Um, I think the work that the Cosmos Institute is doing, Brandon McCord um, and his partner, I think, you know, they are doing some really beautiful research onto the different philosophies that are driving the funding, um, specifically philanthropy funding, um, for, you know, different areas of AI and how we learn about AI and how we research AI. And, you know, his perspective is, hey, we need more of the optimistic, you know, mindset going into some of the research that's being driven. Um, because again, that en energy is going to create vastly different differences and incentives and, and whatnot, um, that I think the doom and gloom mindset. So all that to say, I think the doom and gloom mindset has been covered. <laughs> a lot of funding has gone behind it. A lot of, you know, actions have gone behind that. We need to balance that now with this other perspective. And I think Cosmos is doing a phenomenal job starting that research. Brandon, by the way, has, um, for anyone that doesn't know him, please find him on LinkedIn. He's a phenomenal writer. He publishes a lot of the research, a lot of the things. I think they're gonna start doing that more from the Cosmos side as well. Um, but he has some really easy to understand findings 
around the different philosophies going into how we think about AI and how we see the future of AI and its impact on society. Um, and it's a beautiful rabbit hole to go down on. Yeah, I'm, I'm a huge f fan of Brendan and the work they're doing at Cosmos. And we'll be sure to link to the various uh, information um, as well as some of the other things that you mentioned. And, you know, I'm certainly optimistic about the future and I'm um, excited for people like you that are doing the work to point us in the right direction. Um, and then I've got just a couple of final sort of zoomed out questions for you as we move toward wrapping up. So aside from family, you know, if everything were to end tomorrow, whatever that means to you, what are you either most grateful for or most proud of? Oh my gosh, I have lived, I have, I have really lived a, an expansive life. Um, you know, three years ago, I got to take control over my health and I lost 140 pounds in like two years. Um, and that showed me just like what's possible um, and how much incredible potential each of us has. And so what I'm most grateful for and what I'm most proud of is just living a life where I've been able to see my own power. I've been able to witness other people's power in radical ways, like my mom, like my dad, like my husband. I mean, it is incredible to be surrounded by those stories. Um, and what else is living life, right? Except just like the human experience. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's what I'm grateful for. I love that. And sort of this last big one, I always make sure to ask, uh, if you could snap your fingers and fix one thing in the world, what would it be? And how do you think that change would reverberate? Um, yeah, you know, we have 150 million homeless kids in the world. If they all lived together, it would be the eighth largest country in the world. Um, I'd fix that in a minute. This is the next generation, right? Like the the ripple effects of millions, hundreds of millions. And that's a grossly underestimated number, by the way. Um, hundreds of millions of kids um, just not having psychological safety, not having support, not having education. Um, this doesn't include the billions of kids that don't have access to good education because our education system just sucks. Um, so I would fix the value set and the emphasis and our human mindset we have on the responsibility we feel to the next generation um, because they are our future and they are the more evolved species <laughs> than us. Um, and, you know, they deserve to come into an environment where they can actualize their potential. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great way of putting that. It, you know, human potential often comes up in this question, you know, where would we be if people had the resources they'd need? And I think this, this kind of plays into that as well. You know, we, it's our responsibility to make sure that the younger generation has tons of opportunity and has the ability to unlock all that potential that's going to positively serve the human race. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm a direct example of that. My parents lived a vastly limited life compared to the one I got to live and they made that happen. And then my ripple effects, you know, are changing so many other lives. So it's like every life, every meaningful upwards change can make such a huge difference. And it's just a really gnarly problem that, you know, we all get to confront. So, yeah. <laughs> I think it reminds people how just doing one good, kind act for one person can have tremendous ripple effects. Yes, yes. When given an opportunity to be kind, please be kind. And when not given an opportunity to be kind, create the opportunity to be kind. Absolutely. That's like a big value set my husband and I have. I, I love that and uh, certainly believe in that. And I think that's a great place to end is uh, be kind whenever you can. And, you know, I'm so thankful that you were able to join me today. It was remarkable to hear your story and your journey. Um, can, you know, you've made tremendous progress over your life and career. It's really awesome what you've been able to do. Dude, thank you for your support. Thanks for having me here and just letting me share the story. Um, really, really appreciate you. Absolutely. Talk soon. Thanks for checking out this episode of People Are the Answer. For more information, go to peoplearetheanswer.com. Please like, subscribe, rate, whatever you can do on various platforms. We really appreciate the support. And if you're interested, check out my other podcast, The Late Game Podcast. You can learn more at thelategame.com. Thanks.